Welcome to the Pazic Performance Group Podcast. I am Tyler Pazic, and today we have Nick Childs on the pod pod. So Nick Childs is the pitching coach for the Carolina Mudcats, which is the advanced A affiliate for the Milwaukee Brewers. They're in the minor leagues for the major league club Brewers out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's a native of Cherry Creek, Colorado. Childs most recently worked at UNCO, University of Northern Colorado, where he was the associate head baseball coach, pitching coach, and recruiting coordinator for the UNC Bears in 2019. The 32 year old Childs has additionally coached at Regis University, where he was the pitching coach, and the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma, where he was the pitching coach and lead assistant. Childs earned his master's degree in sports administration from the University. University of Northern Colorado, and he is in his first season with the Mudcats and first in the Brewer season during this unprecedented time. It should be interesting to get into it with him about the mental game and just, you know, working at the next level, making his way up through the ranks from, you know, college baseball, playing in college to coaching in college to now coaching at the professional level. So without further ado, let's get into it. What's up, Nick? Welcome to the Pod Pod. Appreciate you having me, Tyler. It's uh, um, going to be a fun day. Great topic. <laughs> uh, I like uh, I like this topic a lot. So excited to dive into it. Yeah, do the mental game. I mean, obviously, it's my job, so I love talking about it <laughs> all the time. <laughs> But uh, so one of the questions that we were talking about right before we got on was, you know, what are one or two things that you like to see out of your players that you work with and have worked with and will work with in the future, what you like to see out of them from the mental side of the game? Uh, first and foremost, I think just mental toughness, and you can kind of define that in a lot of different ways, but I, I think that it's created through being process oriented and consistent and disciplined. And so uh, I like when guys have a a consistent routine, they're open to new ideas, but they're convicted in what they're doing. Uh, I think ultimately leads to what we call mental toughness and the ability to uh, perform under pressure because that's what we're trying to get out of these guys is how do you do that? And I think the easiest way is, um, or the most beneficial way is having a very sound mental approach to how they're doing everything yeah that's that's huge definitely routine consistency ability to perform under pressure i like how you said it's like the easiest way or not necessarily the easiest but like the simplest way to get down to that and one thing that i was thinking about this morning actually while i was doing my journal is doing simple better you know it's like simplifying down to the process to everything that's necessary without removing anything that's necessary so Mm -hmm. or getting rid of everything unnecessary without or what am I trying to say right now (laughs) getting it down to just the pieces that are necessary basically Uh, and uh yeah so let's talk about pressure for a second because I don't think I've ever talked about pressure on the podcast but it's one thing that I've always been interested in because pressure can create a lot of anxiety or it could create a lot of excitement you know one quote that comes to mind when I think about pressure is pressure makes diamonds so like some people look at it as a blessing and some people look at it as a curse and just like can never perform in the clutch per se so like how do you get guys to yeah perform under pressure I think that goes back to kind of the same things that we were talking about before in that performing under pressure comes back to how you prepare. If you're prepared and I'm a huge believer, I wouldn't be where I am today without being able to work hard. Like I'm, I didn't have a great playing career. There's a lot of things that um, I've done that come strictly from probably my work ethic. And so I think it's the same thing when you talk about performing under pressure, I believe in work ethic. And when you are prepared for a given situation and you have that preparation to fall back on it, you're able to compete in the moment and so then it's just like what you do every day instead of pressure being something that you only experience infrequently hmm. I like what you just said right there at the end about how like pressure is the difference between it being all of the time and just being 
infrequent. So like if pressure is all of the time, that just your base becomes your new, or that becomes your new baseline. So then it's not actually pressure anymore. It's just like day-to-day -day activity for you. But no, it's absolutely. Yeah. I think that uh, it's kind of becoming a buzzword, but our, especially in baseball, but your training environment is so important. And so if we can create game like training environments, then they've been under that quote unquote pressure, I guess, more times than, than some may be. And so I think that that's advantageous. Yeah. There's not a bunch of fans in the stands and stuff like that, but at least they've gone through those situations and had to perform and they've gone through game like experiences. So the better we can create training environments, the better off I think our guys are going to be the more game like the better. So what's one way you guys create a game like experience in practice? Well, I think um, one way is to try to simulate um, things that I've done in the past. This was a big thing that we did at Northern Colorado Regis as well um, is just trying to create a game like atmosphere, even if it's in just a, a short box or a bullpen or something, creating uh, something that can elevate their heart rate, frustrate a pitcher. Um, and it's not to like have to pitch exhausted from a physical standpoint it's like when you give up a double off the wall your heart starts to beat a little bit faster you start to lose your breath you start to lose your focus and so if we can create some sort of environment where there's pressure like that and again coming back to the word pressure but um, whether it's just doing a few jumping jacks or some sort of like competition with two guys throwing at the same time you've got one pitcher going if he misses a spot he loses his spot in line somebody else jumps in and they compete internally that can create some frustration for a guy. And I don't want to like beat a guy down. I don't scream and yell and um, those sorts of things. But like, I want to create a stressful environment. I enjoy seeing our pitchers or our athletes um, struggle during practice because if, if they know that they're in an environment where there's a group of people who care about them and want the, want the best for them. And they understand that that's why the environment is being created the way it is. They're more willing to go through that instead of just thinking that coach is a prick and he's trying to <laughs> make me mad during practice just because it's fun for him. But like, if I can explain to him that this is exactly how you feel when things don't go well in a game and I want to help you through those sorts of things um, in practice, they start to buy in and enjoy those competitive environments. Mm -hmm. And like, if they can learn to be competitive and also learn that it's okay to fail in a safe environment, then when they get out there in an unsafe environment, they're a little bit more likely to take those risks that you want them to take to ultimately perform at the level that you want them to perform at. So um, what can you explain that drill though, where you kind of put the two guys against each other in practice and how that works and how they go to the back of the line I, I was a little bit confused by that but it sounds so, like an awesome drill that could you know benefit a lot of people I I kind of yeah rush through that a little bit but let's say you've got like two pitchers and they're throwing on the same mound and you're working on just uh, and you can make it as broad as um, just executed pitches strikes because I think there's a difference between executed pitches and strikes um, you pick whatever you want the challenge to be or the external focus that you want. And you have player one go up, he hits, uh, he executes three straight pitches and he misses on the fourth. And so he gets, he doesn't get to throw anymore. The next guy jumps up. It's his turn to execute as many pitches in a row. If he misses the first one, next guy gets to go right back to what he was doing the one who is executing less, he's probably a little bit out of rhythm because he's having to wait longer between pitches. And so that creates just a little bit of a competitive environment between the two guys. And also too, the guy who doesn't get to throw as many pitches is going to get a little bit frustrated and that may take his focus off of uh, ultimately what he's trying to do um, with the, with the goal at hand, which is similar to a game. When things don't go our way, we can get distracted and our ability to handle those distractions, I think is what separates guys. Cause sometimes, um, especially at higher levels, the talent disparity, there's not a ton of difference in the talent. It's how well they can go through these situations and handle, um, their day to day, the best are the guys who continue to advance and succeed. 
Yeah, it's the ones with like the most emotional control yeah. that are able to perform at their best most consistently. For sure. Uh, so we brought up, you brought up the word frustration or like frustrated or frustrating probably 10 times already. <laughs> and we're like, you know, 10 minutes into the podcast. But like, why is it so important to get guys frustrated and get them out of control emotionally and you know emotional control leads to physical control so if you're out of control emotionally you're probably out of control physically but like what's the point of doing that so yeah it it forces these guys to go through their process of what is going to happen when they face adversity in a game and so if they have to work through okay how can i slow slow my brain down how can i control my breathing how can I keep my focus on the the next pitch? How can I focus on what I need to do to help the team win um, during the harder times? Then we can create that they're going to feel better about it in a game because they've done it so many different times during their training environments, during games, during practices, um, during schoolwork. Like guys get frustrated during class and it can take them away from what they're trying to do to stay eligible. Um, I I think that it it goes beyond just athletics, but more than anything to uh, short story long, like the more times we can get them to go through their mental process during adversity, the better off they're going to be during competition. Process focused. I love it. That makes me think of getting comfortable being uncomfortable, which is uh, one thing that you know, I think is a little overplayed now, but at the end of the day, it's, it's so true. That's why it said so much. It's kind of like control what you can control. Like you can say that until you're blue in the face and like as much as it becomes old, it's so relevant all the time. Uh, That kind of makes me think of what I was getting my, when I was going in and taking the GRE to get into my master's program, I actually took it twice. The first time I went in there. So, you know, the GRE, you study for it for months and then, well, some of us do, some of us don't. I have have friends who did not study for it and did perfectly fine. I, on the other hand, studied for, I think it was four months. And then I go in there and I take it and uh, let me back up a bit. When I first started take when I first started studying for the GRE, I took a practice test and I got a 257 on it, which a 257 is terrible. That's not getting you in anywhere. Uh, they might have changed up the scoring system now, but basically like a 300 is average, and I got a 257. And so I study for it for four months. I go into the GRE testing center, and the first time I take it, I get like a 302, and nice. I came out of there. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got a 302. It was good or it was better than what I started at, you know, but I had completely gotten away from my plan. I went in there with a plan and I came out of there wondering like, what in the world just happened for the last three and a half hours while I was in there? I'm like, I can't even remember what happened? Like I just blacked out and that happens so many times in sports too. Like you go into the game and you just completely get away from your plan. You come out and you're like, Oh my gosh, how did I, I'm pulled in the third inning and I've given up five runs and I have four walks. I'm like, what the heck happened out there? You know? But then the next time you go out, you're like, okay, I'm going to commit to my plan. And the second time I go in to take the GRE, I committed to my plan and I got a 314, which is, you know, 12 points higher. And I could have gotten into like basically a lot more schools because I had those extra 12 points in my GRE. And it was just because I stuck to the plan. And it's so important in sports too, when you go in there, sticking to a simplified plan so let's kind of dive into that a little bit like when when you're talking about process and you're talking about routines and you're talking about having a plan and sticking to it with your guys what does that plan normally consist of that's uh, i think there's a lot of different components to that's a loaded question (laughs) yeah i mean like it it depends because are you looking at uh, do we want to look at like the macro level of just kind of an outline it's the same thing of like when you ask what's the most important pieces from a mental game standpoint it's it's having a plan so what does having a plan mean yeah let's go macro and then let's let's go macro and then let's dive into some of the micro moments or the, the, the little pillars of it 
Yeah, I mean, shoot, I think it still comes back to how you prepare for each day or even just a practice. And so do you go in with maybe a singular focus or uh, uh, and being trying to minimize it? Because if you're trying to accomplish 10 things in a given throwing session, you're in a lot of trouble. But I think that a lot of times I've coached a lot of guys uh, – um, and a few jump out from the, from the college level that, uh, I've worked with that they go into, they try to fix like four mechanical things in one throwing session and they, and it's not their fault. They want to be great. And so they want to do so many different things that they like come in with this great plan. But a lot of times they get away from maybe the one big thing. And so having a singular focus and a, an attacked and a, and a tangible goal for a practice, a lifting session, I think is where, um, having a plan starts for me. So kind of macro view is making sure that there's, that you have an approach to your training. And I mean, you did a really good job with this from our standpoint at Northern Colorado, uh, basically reverse engineering, our goals. So like, what's the end goal and then building steps backward to how we get there. And then at the end of the day, it just starts with win this pitch. And, but the ultimate goal of being representing selfless effort and excellence for life is what we did as a group. And, or that's what we decided that we stood for as a group. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have the macro, which is, you know, knowing your values and then reaching back, starting with the end in mind. Okay. Like if I want to be like the hardest working player of all time, like then you work back stepwise and stepwise fashion to, okay, what's today's goal. Yeah. And then from there, it's kind of like what, like you said, like what's the big goal for the day. And then even further from that goal, now we step back and we go into the micro little pieces. So like maybe a goal of yours. So what would be like a, like from the guys that you've worked with either this year or last year, what's like one of the goals you see a lot out of pitchers in terms of like, okay, here's my singular, here's my singular focus for the day or Actually, let's go back a little bit further than that. Like, what's a big goal they have in mind? And then how can we break that down into their singular focus for just the day? So going back to, I mean, the guys who I currently coach, they, they all basically, they're driven to be a big leaguer, right? And continue to progress and make a living playing baseball. And they have a lot of different, I think, uh, nuances, or I don't know if that's the right word, but different reasons that continue to drive them. And it's not just professional goals, but um, it's a little bit easier for me to speak to my eight years of experience coaching college baseball, because shoot, before we went into quarantine and everything, I was at spring training for two weeks. So um, the experience level at that um, experience time at that level has been um, not as big. So I'm big on sample sizes and my sample size with college athletes is obviously a lot bigger, but, um, to get back to your question, the, for the guys I coach in college, some are driven by trying to win as many games as they can for the school they're at. Some of them are driven by trying to get into professional baseball. Um, I think both goals are, are good as long as they continue to drive those guys for the betterment of the, of themselves and the, and the team. Um, those are the two like big goals. I think that I would say uh, the most common um, of guys that I've coached. Um, and I think mm -hmm. they're two very good goals. And then from a singular focus on a day, it really depends on the guy, like some guys. And, and to be honest, I think that uh, at first when we started in, in instilling some of these principles at like a place like Northern Colorado, like uh, asking a guy, what do you want to work on today? they kind of look at you blank faced and they it's, you got to ask a bunch of questions to try to encourage them to, and it takes a while to, from a process standpoint to get them to know what they want to work on on a given day. And so, um, but some guys want to work on throwing harder. Some guys want to work on getting more horizontal break to their slider. Um, I think from a daily standpoint, it really varies with, it's very athlete dependent and it's also super variable day to day for certain guys. And I think that sometimes that 
gets guys in trouble too. And it goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning with having a more singular focus and let's get really good at one thing before we move on to another. And so the guys that skip around and they want to work on their slider one day, their change up the next, their uh, command the next day, like there's, I think their bandwidth is being spread too thin and they can't, they're working on three things instead of getting really good at one, which I think is more beneficial to ultimately getting more outs. Mm -hmm. That one of the questions that popped into my head was like the difference between being a novice and being a master. How do you know when you're working with an athlete or just if, if I was an athlete in general, how would I know if I have reached that level of, competency to where I can then move on to the next phase or I can then move on to whatever it is I want to work on next oh man that's that's another really tough one like and I hate this answer but I think that it it depends um are you trying to reach a <laughs> are you trying to reach a level of being uh, yeah are you trying to become a master or are you trying to work to be good enough like let's say Oh man, that makes me think of this Navy SEAL who talks about how better is the enemy of good. Like, dude, if it's good, it's good. Like, it doesn't have to be great. All it has to do is be good consistently. Yeah, I, and that's a really good point, not to get off topic, but I think that that's something that I talk to pitchers a lot about. Like, let's say you're in a bullpen and you're trying to execute a fastball away and you just drill that spot. And then fastball away is the next pitch again. Fastball glove side is the pitch, the, the next pitch. And they yank it into the left-handed batter's box. And I ask them, like, what was different between that pitch and the one you threw that was perfect? Did you try to make that next one better? And they say, yeah, I did. I'm like, well, why? That was, there was no possible way that you could have made a better executed pitch than what we were trying to do than the previous one and then you threw a really bad pitch because you tried to make a great pitch better that didn't need to be better mm -hmm. that's something yeah. that comes up a lot man like trying to make it even better that's that's a very very razor thin line when you make a really good pitch and then you try to make it better like because most likely that leads to probably like you just said leads to yanking it into the left the left-handed hitter's box instead of just re-executing that same pitch again mm -hmm. and that kind of gets back to one thing that I think about a lot is the feeling of throwing that good pitch I think a lot of guys throw that good pitch and then instead of just internalizing that feel and getting back to that exact same feel, they start thinking. They start going, oh, man, I'm going to throw the next one even better. Or, oh, man, that was a shitty pitch. I need to get back to – I need to throw this next pitch even better. And that, that kind of that makes me think of prayer primal or perfect. When you get out of control as a pitcher or as a hitter or as an athlete in general, you normally fall into one of three categories. Again, when you're getting out of control, you're either prayer primal or perfect. So a prayer player is somebody who just hopes, wishes, and prays that, you know, the, they can execute the next pitch or the next play. And then a primal player is somebody who just tries to muscle everything up and they go total caveman on it. And then the perfect player, which is what I think we're talking about right now, is the one who who tries to make every pitch perfect mm -hmm. and of course like perfection is unattainable and I promise you I will not be the first perfect human out there and neither will you <laughs> but um, no. like people, like they try to be perfect over and over again and and then it just leads to analysis by para or paralysis by analysis and they underperform and then next thing they know they're sitting on the bench wondering what happened to them yeah 100 percent so uh yeah, that's like good is the or better is the enemy of good, and sometimes good enough is good enough. And yeah, and so like that's what like to get back to that question. I think that it's a tough one to answer because it depends on the guy. Like, do you probably need to be more of a master of fastball command for in general? Absolutely. So until you should probably be working on fastball command until you are more towards a master status. But if you're just trying to 
develop a fourth pitch? Do you need to bang your head against the wall until it's as good as your best pitch? Probably not. Like you need to have something that you can use in competition to make hitters focus on something else, whatever it is, like whatever the reason for a fourth pitch is the level of competence that you need in that fourth pitch is probably different than the level of competence you need in your best pitch, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's like, that kind of makes me think of just confidence in general, like having that confidence to throw your fourth pitch, even though you know for a fact that it's not as good as your first pitch, Mm -hmm. like how, how do you build that confidence? Cause when you know that it's not that good, And you go up there and you're like, oh man, you can easily get into a state where you're thinking like, just please don't hit this or, okay, I'm going to throw this one. And it's a completely non-competitive pitch. Yeah. And now you're not even competing with it. And then it's like, it just destroys your confidence with your other, with your other pitches. So how do you get them to that level of confidence where they are throwing it in competition? I think this gets back to game like practice. So like having them do more game-like practice in general is is my answer. What's your answer? (laughs) Yeah. For me, I think that it's to build that confidence in a fourth pitch. It's them understanding on why you think that a fourth pitch is important for them. And so if they can, if they can understand what the value of that is and they know that they're only going to be throwing it like 5% of the time. So starter goes out, throws seven innings and a hundred pitches. Maybe he throws five sliders that you added for a reason but they understand what the value of that pitch is and how it complements what they're doing. And they know that they don't have to use it a lot. And that's a tough example for me and not to get Mm -hmm. like too far away from the question, but like, that's a tough example that I ended up leading us to, but I believe in focusing on what you're, what you do really well. And if you're a two pitch guy, be a really good two pitch guy. And because ultimately what you can go like you said go on the mound and throw with conviction and I want to get beat with my best stuff but there's different reasons to add different things for different players like call it a third or fourth pitch and I think that that confidence starts with why you're adding it and if they understand why it's important then they're going to be more prone to be bought into practicing it in training environments with conviction and I think getting our guys to do anything with conviction is probably priority number one that's that's so good like i so I have a I have a story about my brother that that made me think of about how like having one move or having two moves that you go to that are your go-to moves and then like the third and fourth are more like just show show pitches or show moves Mm -hmm. and uh but before i get there what else is good would be if if you're listening right now going in and leaving a review for the podcast you know whether it's a one-star rating or a five-star rating i would truthfully and honestly love you going in there and just leaving a review whether you got anything out of nick and i's conversation right now or one of my podcasts in the past so i would appreciate that tremendously but anyways back to this story my brother when he was nine years old he went down to state well he between nine ten and eleven years old my brother was a wrestler and he would go down state and just dominate everybody but when he was nine years old he went undefeated (laughs) And he had one move. He just put guys in a headlock and took him down and pinned them every single time. It was the funniest thing. And then when he was 11 year old, he couldn't beat anybody because like everybody knew how to defend a headlock, you know, and he didn't, he didn't put in any work to actually learn a different move that he could win with. And uh, but yeah, when he was a nine year old freaking stud, just had one, one move that dominated everybody. And that kind of goes into this pitching example that we're talking about right now, because you can have the best fastball in the world and you can locate it wherever you want. But at the end of the day, it's like, you need something else to complement it and make it better. And, uh, that's, that's exactly what I thought about what I heard you heard you say, like, okay, what is the point of having a fourth pitch? Like right. your reason behind that exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, everybody needs another pitch unless you're Mariano Rivera, I think. But, like, <laughs> if you're one of 20,000 major leaguers, I think it's about 20,000 people who now have played in Major League Baseball. And there's been one guy who's dominated with one pitch. And so the odds of you being that one person probably aren't very good. Yeah, right. That, I mean, even to make it to the MLB and then to be one of 20,000 that play there and have just one pitch, yeah, right. your percentages are pretty low, I would say. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked, about, we talked about kind of your routine at a macro level and getting into knowing your singular focus for that day and just having that one thing that you're going to work on. And then, so let's talk about more, I guess, in-game, in-game stuff for your like day-to-day routines and your day-to-day preparation. And then you get into the game and how do you stay focused or how do you perform under pressure more like let's I like this pressure conversation because here's here's the here's another reason I like the pressure conversation when I got my master's in sports psychology at TCU this was what I really wanted to study but no one had really studied pressure moments everybody studies anxiety and things like that but not really pressure moments so uh, I wound up going a different route with it and I studied mental toughness and anxiety and how those two correlate and then a follow-up study would be about pressure and pressure situations so like when we get into pressure situations in a game and you know like obviously man on third one out and that's the game winning run there's going to be just naturally more energy or in the game around that play compared to if it's the first inning and a man on third with one out and the score is zero zero, you know? So ultimately, ideally as a pitcher, as, as a player, we want to go pitch to pitch, but there's just going to be more energy and your arousal state as an athlete is going to be higher. So how do we stay within that ourselves how do we stay within ourselves and not over compete or get timid and under compete but just stay where we need to be to ultimately do our best so yeah I mean I think that again it it comes down to and we've talked about this a lot like and I've said it a lot just like I've said frustration a million times but being process oriented and having a process and this is something again like from a coaching standpoint I'll use an example for for myself and what helps me um, feel prepared and perform in, in a game situation, right? When you and I sat down last year and we built out like my game day routine from the moment I wake up in the morning and it was written out and it was something that I printed out and had with me every single day during game day. So I could literally make a checklist of what I was doing from the time I got up to breakfast, to working out, to getting to the field, to like printing off scouting reports, to posting scouting reports. And so not to go through my entire plan for the day. I think it's honestly worth it though. Like I was going to say, I want to cut you (laughs) off and just highlight this because for those that are listening, Childs and I sat down, was that a year or two? That was last season, wasn't it? It would have been in the spring, like uh, probably spring. early spring of 19. Yeah. 2019, yeah. And uh, we went through his whole day of what it's like for him to just everything that he does during the day to ultimately set him up for success so that, again, getting back to doing simple better, like making his routine simple enough to where like he's getting everything done that he needs to get done without forgetting anything that's necessary. And of course, when you write stuff down, you're more likely to accomplish it. I think uh, one of the studies I bring up about goals a lot is just by writing down your goal, you're 46% more likely to actually accomplish that goal. So like same thing goes for your routine like putting those mini goals into your routine. Okay. Getting the scouting report posted, getting it up there for the guys, talking to the different guys about it, doing these different things as a coach to ultimately set yourself and your team up for success. So uh, can we roll through maybe just a quick synopsis of your game day routine again? I know you kind of got into it before I went off on this tangent, but yeah, I I think a big thing. And the reason why we got down to making this was, um, just making sure that I was checking the correct boxes with every single situation, actually like when the first pitch was thrown. Um, 
everything's pretty easy or it, it, I had an easier time when you know exactly what's going to happen. But we had this conversation because the game is super inconsistent. There's a ton that goes on. There's a ton of changes. Do we need to get this person hot in the bullpen? Do we need to sit this guy down? When do we need to make a pitching change? Um, all those sorts of things. It, did it start raining? Whatever the case may be. And so having a plan for that, those game situations. And for me, it was um, having it written out how I stood or words to use, words to avoid in the dugout. Um, what I was doing when we were – on defense and my pitcher was on the mound. And so that's pretty easy just because you're calling pitches, you're engaged, but what are we doing when we're, when our team's up to bat? Um, how much is too much information for the guy on the mound? And then that comes back to knowing your pitchers and what they need. And so having that relationship, what when they struggle, what's their focus that, what's their thought image feeling that they go through to get themselves back on track. And so um, some guys want to talk more in, in between innings. So you sit down, you have a chat until there's one out and then you let them be, you go check the chart, who's up the next inning, what's the situation dictate. And so having a set plan as far as, okay, inning over, I'll look at the chart for a minute. Then I'll go to the pitcher, let him take a breather ask him a couple questions, see what he needs, go to the next thing on the checklist. And so that was super important. Those were the big things I wanted to hammer. And then uh, after that, with whatever time was left in the inning, it was preparation for the rest of the, the next inning and three innings, four innings down the road, however much game time was kind of left to put, try to put ourselves in, a most, in as well of a prepared situation as we possibly could. Mm -hmm. so that's from that's from a coaching perspective of mm -hmm. like what your routine is now yeah. what about like getting your guys to compete in those high pressure situations at their best like what is when it comes to having a plan and having a routine what's like a plan that you teach those guys or a mental checklist for those guys to go through so that it's like you know when that high pressure situation comes they're just like hey stick to the plan and you'll be fine uh, I think a big thing is uh, that can help guys is something like shadow bullpens because they've gone through uh, you can put them in a lot of different whether it's whether it's scripted whether they're basing it off of what's going on in a game whether it's coach led um, there's a lot of different op options in that type of um, practice setting where they're literally practicing their in-game routines. And so they know what they're trying to do. And so I think it starts with writing it down and sometimes they're going to change what their routine is and that's okay, but they can go back into whatever document they have and change their routine for something for the better, but practicing the mental side of being in a game. And I think something like a shadow bullpen shadow at bats is something that I've seen help guys a lot. And a shadow bullpen for those listening is basically you're taking the ball out of the equation and you're just putting them on the mound without a ball, telling them to mentally go through and visualize executing the plan or the pitch or the situation. So like literally you could stand there as a coach next to them. So this one would be the coach led example that child's just brought up and saying like, okay, man on third, one out, bottom of the ninth, two, two count slider, backdoor slider and then they get on the mound they go through their routine they take a breath they have their final thought image or feeling that goes through their head and then they execute the pitch to the best of their ability which they're vividly imagining so hopefully it's a pretty damn good pitch uh, yeah if you're not visualizing success then that's we're not we're we're in trouble if you have the freedom <laughs> but like sometimes i think you have to throw in like uh slider you spiked it what's the next thing that you're going to go through when things didn't go well. And, but I think also too, uh, an important thing to note about shadow bullpens is that it's not a physical drill. Guys are going to want to try to make their mechanics good during this sort of setting, but it's getting them away from, I don't care like how your delivery looks. We're not working on the physical state 
or physical mechanics of your delivery. It's literally a mental routine that you're going through. So the delivery itself isn't important. What you're doing between pitches is way more important. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to a plan, what's like maybe a three-step or a five-step checklist that a player should go through before they throw the pitch? Hmm. Three or five step plan, like between pitches. Yeah. I think it's different for different guys because I think that sometimes, like, having a five step checklist that they're going through between a pitch may just overload them with information, information or they're thinking too much. And so, a, a big thing for me is it, it depends, like, say the pitcher is calling his own game. Okay. The first thing I want to do is probably before I step back on the rubber, make sure I know what pitch I want to throw and what I'm going to throw with the most conviction. The next one is maybe making sure that I know the sign system we're using. Say there's a runner on second base. I don't want to get on the mound and get confused. And then that distract me from what I'm trying to execute. And the final thing would be making sure that when I get on the mound, and I think the most important thing is when I get on the mound, I get my sign, I can go through that good breath that, like you said, that final thought image feeling so I can execute that next pitch with the most conviction possible. Mm -hmm. And visualizing, visualizing that success that we talked about. That's good. I mean, like getting them up there and just going through that routine and ultimately getting them to the point where it's like they're visualizing them succeeding themselves, succeeding with that pitch at the highest level. And yeah they see it in their head. I mean, with the most conviction possible, you know, hundred percent conviction, hundred percent trust. And just knowing that they're going to throw that pitch where they want to throw the pitch. 100%. And, and you know, some things don't work out like other things, some things don't work out. So what happens when things don't work out and they, they start to get out of control emotionally, what do you teach guys to get them back in control? To get back in control, it's having some sort of release. And that's something that, I, again, I've, I've learned a lot from um, working with you is having a, a plan uh, that we can execute through adversity. And so that release is something that can neutralize them and they have some trust in to get them back to kind of to neutral and get them away from that frustration that we've talked a lot about today. Mm -hmm. And so having a plan to handle adversity that they know that they can go to, to slow their brain down, to be able to breathe, um, to be able to get back to visualizing success. And so I think you have to practice going through adversity. And I think also that gets back to the pressure situation thing, mm -hmm. like noticing that if you feel like you are completely Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Somebody just joined our uh, joined our call. I was wondering if that's <laughs> planned or not. <laughs> uh, let me lock this. That was hilarious. Had, um, there were hackers on a Zoom hitting discussion that I was just observing yesterday. There were some hackers that got into it because they had to tweet out the um, the link. Uh -huh. And it was pretty ridiculous. They were screen sharing and drawing obscene pictures. It was kind of wild. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I've never had that happen, but that was yeah, hilarious. Apparently, apparently that's a thing now is uh, Zoom hacking. Those Zoom hacking. They don't Jeez have anything better Louise. to do with their time, I guess. I don't know. Oh man, that's funny. Yeah, for those listening right now, we're recording this on Zoom and we just had somebody join our meeting, which was super random. <laughs> but... um. Yeah. So like getting back to the whole pressure situation thing, like having something to go to where they can notice inside of themselves. Okay. Like I'm, ele I'm in an elevated state. I'm in an mm -hmm. elevated state of arousal right now. And I need to get back to wherever I pitch my best. So say on a scale of one to a hundred, that's like, maybe they perform their best at a 40 and mm -hmm. they're up at like a 78 because of the situation. They're like, okay, I notice I'm up there. So now I'm going to use my breath. I'm going to stick to my plan and I'm going to execute the pitch. And that's, that's literally what it comes down to, especially for pressure situations when you're frustrated, basically anything that puts you out of your zone of control, zone yeah. of optimal performance. 
Mm -hmm. So, and that's where I think uh, like the pitchers and it's the same thing as like, why add a fourth pitch? It, it all comes back to them being really, they, they know themselves really well. And so that's where I think it's really important to have those conversations with guys on what is your optimal arousal state? Cause some people like Max Scherzer is just like, it looks like he's just about ready to punch whoever <laughs> comes and talks to him square in yeah. the face and he hates all hitters. And then there's guys like Zach Granke who like, they don't show emotion. They never show frustration. They look super cerebral. They're super calm. They always look super under control and both guys are really good. Right. So like both, both situations work. And so what works best for one may not work best for the other. And so getting your athletes to make sure that they know and understand how they perform best, I think is really, really important. And then that comes back to just how important relationships are and how well, if you're an athlete, like listening to this, like how well do you understand how to get the best out of yourself? And I think that's something that I know you do religiously is journal. Like when you have really good days, make sure you write stuff down on why it was really good. And because you need something to go back to and to better understand how to get in that optimal mental state most often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so key. I love that you brought that up because I do talk about that all the time is like writing down what it's like when you're going at your best and things are going really well, because then when things aren't going well, you can go back and be like, Oh yeah, I forgot. That's exactly what I was thinking or Oh, that's what I was doing on those days when I was at my best. And you can just go through that and it'll put you into that same state because, mm -hmm. you know, people say it all the time, like fake it till you make it. Well, if you go through that same routine and same habit, your brain is going to go to those same thinking patterns. And of course, like thoughts become actions. So then your actions will fall in line with that routine and that habit of playing at your best. But it's like, if we don't have that written down, then it's kind of like we're always searching and feeling and trying to find that optimal state when you could just go back through the checklist and boom you're there and just mm -hmm. consistently get there at a, at a very high rate. Yeah. So I like that. Well, uh, yeah, I'm going to, let's wrap this up. It's getting near that, getting near that time that I like, I like to keep it at 45 to 60 minutes, but, uh, what's your, what's your kind of number one takeaway from this call or the number one thing you wanted guys to get out of this call? Uh, number one is definitely, I, I think that, at the end of the day, having a defined process is so important. Like, again, it's, it's something that I think we all know, but I think that it takes a lot to truly buy in and be disciplined to being process oriented instead of relying on results. Because if results are dictating how good we think our day was or wasn't, or how a game was or wasn't, then you're not going to reach your true potential in my opinion i think there's a lot of research that backs that up as well um, but having a defined purpose and process is where i would always start with guys from the mental side of things mm, having a purpose and process i like that that kind of rolls off the tongue but yeah. uh oh and one thing that you did say before that that i got into that tangent about journaling is awareness like knowing who you are as a player, that's absolutely key. And yeah, if you can build that awareness, then you'll be more in control of yourself because what you're aware of, you can control what you're unaware of controls you. And that's where that frustration comes into play. And that's where all of those negative, unproductive, unpleasurable emotions that again, we're trying to create in practice. That way you know how to cope with them when you're actually out there on the mound and you're able to just really see them as a neutral experience instead of a negative experience. But if we don't make games or if we don't make practice game like then that never happens in the first place. We never get sure. into that state. So man, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think Me I'm too, gonna man. name it I think I'm gonna name it how to perform under pressure. <laughs> how to perform like under it. pressure, answer, purpose and process. Process. Boom. All right, man. Well, thanks for being on. I appreciate it. I'll appreciate talk to you it, Pazic. See ya.